The big bear stopped 30 feet in front of me. I slowly worked my hand into my bag and pulled out the magnum. I peered down the gun barrel into the dull red eyes of the huge grizzly. We stared at each other for what might have been seconds, but felt like hours. I knew once again that I was not going to pull the trigger. My shooting days were over. I lowered the pistol. The giant bear flicked his ears and looked off to the side. I felt something pass between us. I didn't know that the force of that encounter would shape my life for decades to come. So that was the last time I carried a gun in grizzly country. They'll get you in more trouble than they get you out of. When somebody does something great like that for you, you're in debt. And if they need help, you pay them back. The voiceless really needed a human voice, and I just decided that I'd do my best. Back in the 60s, I either had to be a full-time student or be married with a child, or you got your ass drafted and sent to Vietnam. I was at uh, University of California, Berkeley, taking graduate courses in comparative literature, but not enough to be full-time. And the draft caught up with me. By that time, I was just kind of tired of running. And I said, take me. When I was trained to be a Green Beret medic, I had this little road map. It was a Wyoming and Montana. And I took it with me to Vietnam. After a 14-hour day of treating sick people, I would just stare at this map. In my mind, I'd fly through it and look for bears and moose. And I was looking at it one night when all of a sudden, the mortar started raining down on it and the shrapnel was blown everywhere. I think I was somewhere in the Yellowstone, flying over Pelican Valley, going up a stringent creek, seeing the steam come up. The next thing I know, you know, that shit has hit the fan, and I'm running through the trenches and returning mortar fire. The map was very useful in Vietnam because if I ever got out of there alive, I was going to go look at those blank spots. After the Tet Offensive, I just saw too many dead children. So I was out of sword when I got back here. And I went to one place that I was comfortable, and that was the wilderness. I needed solitude so much. My companions ended up being grizzlies. Those bears saved my life. Once I knew they were in trouble, I decided I was going to record their plight on film. So that took another 15 years. Filming seasonally, working low-level jobs for the park service. Either a backcountry ranger or fire lookout. The lowest jobs you can get. By that time, I'd scouted everywhere that I could get within a week because, you know, I had 100-pound camera units and things like that. I'd find a place where the bears would come in thick and just set up and wait. It was kind of like warfare. Pitching invisible camps, leaving no tracks. 
even at that level of trying to be really careful around the grizzlies, I still ran into enough of them, and it was time to give them a break. I thanked them for allowing me to hang out so long, and I vowed I wasn't going to bother them anymore. But I still had to protect them. Saving the wild is the mother of all things. That's where we gathered our intelligence. I think it's essential for life, for growth, for wisdom. If we are to have survival, that's how and where it's going to take place. It's not going to take place on Mars or in any goddamn spaceship. It's going to take place in, you know, the remnants of that original habitat that we tend to call wilderness. The grizzly bear on this continent is the one animal capable of reminding the most arrogant species on Earth its true place in the world, and that's Homo sapien. Without our arrogance and firearms and dominion, we're just another flavor of meat. To live out on the land with a grizzly bear, you're not the dominant creature and you're physically aware of that. You don't think about your portfolio or your girlfriend. You're looking and smelling because you need to know where the grizzlies are. That's sort of an enforced humility and it's a healthy thing. If you truly try to live in the land, and not run through it like some mountain jogger. You know, you're gonna take this in the stock. A culture like ours, we fear what we don't know, and we really hate what we fear. To know the bear, to know the unknown, make a friend of that kind of fear, it does expand that tolerance towards all other kinds of beings. It's outside yourself. It approaches that quality of wildness that lives in all of us. What I've aimed to do is to save habitat. That's the most satisfying expression of joy I know. When you're down, when you're depressed, get outside and do something. So you know enough that you know how important it is to preserve and save for your children and your grandchildren. If it's grim, you know, find something. Just a piece of beauty. You can find that every day. In the woods, throughout the desert, down the canyon. It's the best cure I know for the metaphysical icky poos. I do what I feel is necessary to fight for wild causes, and I've done that all my life. And you know, the worse it gets, the more the fighters are gonna fight. Arm yourself with friendship and love the earth. You gotta live consciously every day. 
That's how I'm fighting for my children and for the grizzly bears. Are you going to do anything else? It goes with a polar bear spear. <laughs> this might not be my hat. It's a little tight. It's a Jeff Bridges hat. He had a lot more hair than me. One out of a hundred. You'd, you'd make it through. The rest of the time, you'd be polar bear chow. Let's see if we can get it. 